And welcome to the last episode of NWHL Open Ice for the foreseeable, for the foreseeable future. You know, don't worry about it. We'll be back. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in week after week, month after month. We started this in January, not knowing if people were going to tune in Monday night to talk about sports and here we are there's nothing else going on but this so why aren't you tuning in <clears throat> but i digress thank you all for being here we have an excellent episode we're not talking about the end until the end of the episode so just don't talk about it <laughs> don't talk about it uh hi nanny hi hi charlie uh thank you guys for being here i appreciate it tonight we have of course it's a special episode do i even need to say it's a special episode the last episode, of course, it's going to be special. We have Shelly Picard, Michelle Picard, to be known as Shelly from now on, who is absolutely outstanding, right? If you would have told me at any point in my career that I would be regularly talking to Olympians, I'd be like, what capacity, right? She is an outstanding human being. Outstanding human being. Outstanding human being. Um, so Shelly is an Olympic silver medalist in case you were asleep for all of 2014. Um, I would argue, I would argue that like two of the most influential U.S. teams in the past 10 years have been the soccer team. Uh, and then the U.S. women's national hockey team. Ex extremely influential. Like 2014 was a remarkable moment. I don't care about affiliation. I don't care about thought process. We are proud of every single woman who puts on that US jersey. We are proud of you. Congratulations. And that is why having Shelly in the studio is, is so exceptional because I am so proud of every single woman on that team. And I will be till the day that I die because they have done something they have done more for women's hockey. We have all collectively as a group done more for women's hockey than we could ever imagine because we are stronger together. So Shelly was a member of the Harvard Crimson for four years. The last two years, she wore a C on her on her, on her her sweater. Uh, then she joined the Metropolitan Riveters. She put back on that USA jersey in 2019 to play for the Rivalry Series uh, and now serves as the NWHL Deputy Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, kids at home, anyone who's out there watching, please welcome Shelly. Shelly, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, we're doing fantastic. We're happy to have you. Um, so thank you for coming on the show. My first question... I've been thinking about it for a really long time. Um, you grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, true or false, you were born in a swamp. <laughs> true, but I should clarify, <laughs> born in a swamp. Technically, there's one behind our house in the woods. Uh, 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 <laughs> ogres. Ogres have layers. 
Yeah. Onions have layers. Has anyone, has everyone ever called you like because of your like affiliation and not you know because you know Shrek was also born in a swamp and he also has huge traps. Same. <laughs> Uh, no, no one's made that connection, but oh, maybe that's okay. But you were born in a swamp, so I'm just saying. Uh, I was reading an article about you today, and you said you were basically born on the rink. Um, you said, I was nine years old when I started telling everyone in my family that I wanted to be a hockey player, and the best thing about it was that no one laughed at me. They all supported me, encouraged me, and that was so important. I, I love that. I freaking love that. Uh, you, had, you had a rink in your backyard. That's amazing. So... Like, a lot of your family members played hockey, right? He had an older brother who played. And so I was just, like, the rink rat, um, just following him around. And uh, when it was my turn to start playing, I mean, like, behind our house with the, was the swamp that my dad was sort of right. helping. Um, and we would just be out there skating all the time. Um, and I couldn't wait for my turn to be able to play. And then your turn was just, like, a huge domination in the, in, in the world. <laughs> Just wor world domination was your turn just to be clear i think i waited a little while for world domination but <laughs> my statistics say otherwise but that's okay you know it's fine you can be humble it's fine we're used to that here um so at harvard you you did some stuff um you were there for four years you captained the last two years you played in 129 games you scored 53 total points and your rating was plus 103 um but the, the coolest part of your stats is that you went to Sochi in the middle of your career, in literally the middle of your career. So you're like, you're chilling in Cambridge. It's the winter. It's Boston. It's like 20 degrees. And you're like, nah, man, let's go to Russia. <laughs> Russia. So what was it like in the middle of your college career, picking up, putting on that USA sweater and going to Sochi and, and representing all of us? Yeah, so I'm, that was my dream for a, a long time. It was all just the time pretty surreal. Uh, and so we actually had Olympic tryouts like the June um, th that summer. Uh, so I found out then that I'd have to take a year off from school. And so I finished my sophomore year of college, uh, had those Olympic tryouts in June, uh, took the year off, participated in the Olympics, had an amazing experience where I moved to Arlington, Massachusetts, and we just trained there 24 seven um, in, in like north of Boston. Um, and then went to Sochi in February and um, had the most uh, <laughs> unforgettable experience, I should say. Um, obviously coming in second at the time was really hard to, to swallow. And, mm -hmm. um, but now obviously looking back can be proud of uh, our whole team's efforts and proud of the experience. Yeah, it is so hard because when you're an athlete and you get a silver medal, that's me that means you lost your last game, right? That means <laughs> yeah. you lost your last game. When you get a bronze medal, that means you won your last game. And scientific studies have looked at have looked at the happiness of athletes after their final game. And bronze medalists are exponentially, they yeah. feel more satisfied than silver medalists. But I mean, everyone watching at home, there was zero disappointment in any of our bodies. We were just like so unbelievably proud of all of you. So unbelievably proud of everything that you've done for us. Um, so I'm sorry that you felt disappointed, but we're all still really, really, really proud of you. Um, so congratulations. But what was it like, like living in the Olympic Village, training with these amazing athletes, going to work every day and that work being something that you so enjoyed, that you so loved? Yeah, I mean, it was, I had, I don't even know if I have words, um, like the whole <laughs> training, training experience was, uh, I was just so used to like, you go to school in the morning, and then after you go to go to practice, um, but I took out the school part and just went to practice. And went to practice. <laughs> so, um, I was pretty pumped. And then, um, and just like, we had just amazing teammates and all of us towards this goal, obviously, of, of winning gold medal. And um, so just it was just fun getting to wake up and go to the rink. Obviously a lot of hard work, a lot of challenges. Um, but overall just super excited that I got to wake up and go to the rink every day. Um, and then at the Olympics, uh, was, so the Olympic village is, uh, basically it was like a street of, uh, ap like apartment complex. Essentially. Mm -hmm. and the United States had their own building. And so we were in the same sort of complex with, um, like Bob Sledders and uh, the <laughs> right next door. And, and, um, and so there were certain common areas like 
there's the athletic training and there's like a video game type area where you could just hang out and relax and that's so you, me that that I want that yeah <laughs> so you could you just sort of bump into other athletes and get to sit, like ask them about I don't know just like you're just all normal human beings and then you'd see them on tv two hours later competing for a medal and um, and same thing, like when you went to go grab food um, there, all the athletes are together, regardless of what country you're from. And so you'd sit down and you hear all these different languages. And um, obviously some countries you could communicate with and just build some relationships. Um, so I think that was the most uh, amazing part was just the interaction with the other athletes um, and getting to know them a little bit on like a normal level. And yeah. then, you know, a couple hours later, watching them compete <laughs> at the final stage. So um, I think that was probably the most amazing part. So I feel like my whole career choices, you know, going to medical school, getting into Georgetown, like doing everything that I've ever done in life has led to this moment, this question that I'm about to ask you. Okay. What was the food like? <laughs> I've always I've always wanted to know that question. What was the food like in the Olympic Village? Uh, the food was, was great. So it was um, this big uh, tent type area. Um, and they had all different types of food. Um, so regardless of sort of where you were from, you could find something that you liked. Um, and so, but like for me, my tray every time I have food from all these different countries. Um, and so I got to try a lot of different things. Um, but then like, obviously if it was like a game day or something, I'd stick to what I knew, but, um, so I got to try food from all different countries and I just sort of go, I've like, got in the habit of you go and you just sort of take a lap and see, see what, <laughs> what was available um and then just have a mishmash of all these different things you're like shelly why did you gain 37 pounds <laughs> while you were at the olympic village you're like i have no idea the buffet yeah. buffet i have no idea i think yeah two weeks of all you can eat um uh, definitely <laughs> yeah yeah that's my dream just to go to the olympics not as an olympian just to eat the food in the olympic village hopefully one day i will be able to realize those dreams um so from the the sochi games you you finished your career at harvard and then you went and you played for the riveters for three years um you played for three seasons you won an isabel cup i want to know about the riveters because i have like very specific emotions about all of the teams that play in the nwhl right now like i i have i love every single one of the teams but the riveters they're different in my mind they're like they're that like gritty underdog that is always going to do not exactly what I want them to do, but I'm still going to love them. And just just talk to me about being on the Riveters and playing for them th for three years and what you saw develop in their play, develop in that that style. I would love to hear about the Riveters. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I felt super fortunate graduating from college. I was really excited to join the NWHL and um, ended up coming to, to New Jersey and um, that first year, um, had amazing teammates and, uh, Chad is our, our coach. And we were just sort of this like hardworking group. Um, I don't know if like necessarily the most talented, um, <laughs> but definitely a really fun locker room, just really enjoyed coming to the rink. And at the time I was a, a tutor at a school. And so just having that balance of working and then coming and just like have a blast with some amazing people. Um, and so as the season went on, we really started to hit our stride. And, and by the end of the season, um, we were really feeling great about our abilities and um, going into playoffs. And then we faced the, the Buttes um, in, in the semifinals and had this had a really tough loss. Um, mm. And so came back the, the following year um, with a little bit of a chip on our shoulder and, and really like we were coming back wanting that Isabel Cup and wanting a little revenge. For sure. Um, and, and, it, and we felt it right from the beginning of the season. Like our goal was to win the Isabel Cup. And it was just a little different like swag, I guess, that year. And uh, Chad, another year under his belt coaching and sort of knew and had a lot of returning players. And we added some really strong players. Um, and so mom momentum really built throughout the year. And um, and we had that amazing game against the Buttes again in the finals and um, the one nothing win. And it was like the celebration, having that experience just growing up, like, thinking about winning uh an isabel cup or a mm -hmm. professional champion like that wasn't something that it could dream of and then just to sort of be able to reflect and think about wow um this is where like it was just more than a championship just knowing sort of the history yeah and i don't mean like gritty underdogs in the sense that they weren't good what i mean is that the riveters are always going to grind out to the last <laughs> minute no matter 
no matter what game it is. Like they're just so hardworking. They're so unpredictable. Mm-hmm. They they just I feel like it is that chip on the shoulder. I don't know. It's like that New York state of mind, that Empire state of mind, where it's like I don't care what the score is, I don't care what your record is, I'm gonna beat you and <laughs> try and stop me. You know, yeah. like that's that's how I feel the Riveters are. I just I love I love the Riveters, but I can't talk anymore because I can't reveal any any secrets. Um, <laughs> uh, so after playing for the Riveters for three years, you put back on that U.S. sweater, right? You rejoined the U.S. Women's National Team uh, for the rivalry series. So, you know, coming from being like a 20-year-old to being significantly more experienced, significantly wiser, how is it different the second time you put on that USA jersey? Uh, I, absolutely. I was a bit older and I'd worked um, in a school, I'd worked full time for a couple of years at that point. And um, there's just a little bit different perspective uh, for me. And um, there was a real, I, like just a greater appreciation for the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, and like my, I don't think I, like my love for the game was probably even bigger than it ever had been at that point. Um, yeah. Just because I had an opportunity to really like reflect and realize like, what it meant for my life um, and what it, the role it had played and where I was at. Um, and so getting to, to put on that Jersey again and earn that spot um, was really, it was, it was really special. And uh, right up there with that, all the other times that I'd, I'd worn the Jersey, um, yeah. just felt really grateful to have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- so you've put on the U.S. sweater multiple times. You've won the Isabel Cup. You've won gold medals. You've won silver medals. You've been a captain of multiple teams. You've been awarded the NWHL Foundation Award. Aside from Sochi, what was your favorite hockey memory? That's a tough question. Um, That's why I get think- paid the big bucks. <laughs> I think two moments come into my head. One, definitely uh, winning the Isabel Cup final um like I'd spoken about earlier just because of knowing um sort of everything that culminated to even have that ability as a Mm -hmm. hockey player um and the way that we won and the season that we'd had and just sort of knowing that some of those players wouldn't you know play hockey again and yeah uh, I don't know so that was that was special and one I'll, I'll never forget um and right up there is as a growing up in Massachusetts getting to play at Harvard um I'm lucky enough my junior year to win a beanpot championship at harvard against bc um so that's another moment i'll never forget getting to yeah. win the beanpot um so those are those are two that i that i don't know if i can uh choose between them so i think you're the third person on this show who has mentioned the beanpot tournament but to people outside of the out of new england like no one knows what that means right <laughs> yeah. so so for, for everyone at home and, and maybe also me can you just like give us the tweet chat version of that? Absolutely, yeah. So it's a, tur- a tournament uh, between the f- between four schools in Boston: uh, BU, Northeastern, BC, and Harvard. Um, and it's just two games ch- competing mm-hmm. for it. It's just sort of like for some bragging rights. And um, I don't know the history of like how long. I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> but <laughs> so it's just sort of uh, bragging rights in Boston. It's really spe- it's in February. So for us, it's. Um, Tuesday night, first two Tuesdays in February. And um, for the women, it rotates like which school you play at. So you get mm-hmm. to play at every school. Uh, the men play at, at the garden. Or, I don't know. New York people might get mad at me for calling it the garden, but uh, the Boston <laughs> um, uh, arena. And then, um, yeah, so it's just bragging rights. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I feel better now knowing more <laughs> about that stuff. Stuff that I should have Googled, but have not. Shelley Picard will teach you. So you serve currently, you've kind of stepped out of the direct player position. Uh, I've noticed you still have those traps, though, so you're still working on that fitness. Um, And you serve as the NWHL Deputy Commissioner and Director of Player Development. You're going from being involved every single day to being more of the boss and being in charge of people. How has that transition gone? (laughs) Um, it's been a great transition. I don't know if I necessarily think of myself as the boss. Um, you're the boss. But- <laughs> Everyone knows you're the boss. <laughs> um, but it's been, it's been challenging. I'm learning a lot, um, but definitely ha- like super proud to be involved. Um, 
And I think like as a player, you sort of know that a lot goes into running and, and making sure, you know, the league is as great as it can be. Um, but now to actually learn what goes into it, um, I, I wish I'd been a, like, I wish there was a way as a player, I could have been like, just thanked so many more people all the time. Um, but it's super grateful to just to be involved in, in helping um, be, a, be a part of the NWHL. Yeah. We're happy to have you. And uh, <laughs> people in chat have pointed out that you've always been the boss. So I'm, I'm sorry for that correction. I really apologize. <laughs> Um, so you've served on a leadership role in, in multiple teams now for multiple years in multiple capacities. If you're someone who is, you know, I feel like sometimes you pick captains for a variety of reasons, right? You pick a captain because they're the best one on the team. You pick a captain because they're, they've are they got this cult of personality. Or you pick a captain because they're the most competent. So if you are someone who has just been thrusted into this leadership position, and, you know, you're in charge of these athletes who, who may or may not be more talented you, than you. I'm talking from personal experience now. Um, how do you lead them? How do you, do you have any tips for leadership skills, for management skills of that team? Uh, I think the biggest thing I've learned is to listen first. Um, I think teammates really appreciate, like, when you just listen um, to yeah. what they're feeling, what they're thinking. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, that you can do anything major about what's going on, but um, even just listening and trying to help. Um, and then the second thing would be being consistent. Um, if you show up every day willing to put in the hard work and, and being a great teammate, um, people are going to be a lot more willing to follow. Um, yeah. If you're sort of wishy-washy and, and not showing up doing the hard stuff every day, then uh, you're really quickly going to lose the trust of your teammates. 100%. So just... Yeah, I mean, I feel like when anyone who's ever looked up you more than for a second uh, has known that that is someone who you are, right? You're willing to put in the work. You're willing to put in the time. You care. You're not just talking about it. So, I mean, yeah, you're welcome. No big deal. But so you're the director of player development. Um, and Anya was on, Anya Packer, if you don't know her, was on the uh, show a couple weeks ago. And she mentioned... Uh, that some of the players had desired more time for training, more time for practice. Is that something that you're working on in your new role? Maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that we're aware of um, and hearing the players and uh, something that we are working hard to be able to provide. Um, and also awesome that our players want that extra time uh, to be able to put the work in to keep, mm -hmm. keep getting better. So on our end, it's super exciting to hear that. Um, and working hard to make it happen. And our GMs do an incredible job of working yeah. with facilities to, to give our athletes as much as possible. Um, so definitely looking forward to, to being able to provide that for players. Um, 100%. Because what you have is a, just a hugely talented group of athletes who maybe are only practicing together a couple times a week. And for obvious reasons, right, We they're not practicing five days a week together. But I can only imagine, you know, as this league progresses, right, it's the fifth year. We're in our infancy. We shouldn't be able to walk upright, yet we're crushing everything. No big deal. But uh, it, we're in our infancy, and we are working towards having more practices, having more games, having more time for the players to spend on this right now. So when that moves forward, it's it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be so good. Um. <laughs> So speaking of our players and our talented players, uh, Kendall Cornine was announced as the first player to sign for the 2020-2021 season. Rebecca Morse was not far behind. Should we be looking? I mean, like, I know I'm like abusing my position right now as like an outsider who can ask these questions. And if you don't need to say anything, you don't have to say anything. But should we expect more players to sign in the upcoming weeks? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we've been super fortunate to have players who are excited to, to, to come back. And so, um, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're getting ready for season six and couldn't be more excited. <laughs> You're like, I'm not going to say anything and I hate you for asking that question. <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> no, no, we're excited. It's, be ready for it. <laughs> I feel like just very biased because as, as someone who's about to marry an ex NWHL player, um, I just want you to re-sign Amber Moore for the Riveters. Can you just, can you talk to someone about that? 
Um, yeah, I got it. I'll make the call tomorrow. All right, just write that down. <laughs> write it, write it down. Okay, Chris, we're calling you, buddy. Come on. All right, so can we just talk? Let's talk some like hardcore hockey talk for a second. Okay. Yeah. You are arguably the best, one of the best, best defense women who has ever graced the ice ever, <laughs> ever. If you were to talk to someone who is a budding defense player. What would be like the top three tips you would give them to be successful? Um, well, first, that's a huge compliment. I don't know if I've just I earned that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I um, mean, you, you have a you have a silver medal on the U.S. Women's National Team, so I don't know what more you need. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> what? Okay, <laughs> I was born um, in a swamp. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, as far as uh, tips for defensemen um I mean I I always really enjoyed and prided myself on um honestly like being up against the other team's top forwards and Mm -hmm. uh getting to shut them down or at least try to shut them down and frustrate them um and so sometimes I think it's sort of like there's a focus on scoring and and all that but also being someone that like your team can rely on that like if you're out there like nothing bad is is gonna happen yeah. um and and being consistent with that day in and day out um so for me that was something that I always like that always just got me like jazzed up and obviously like some you know you get beat sometimes and whatever you work harder to, to get better um so I think like having that edge about you whether like for me that's what that would what pumped me up and um, something that I focus on for my career, but other people are relied on for their ability to score and their shot from the point and mm-hmm. all that. So whatever it is, um, be good at it and own it um, and know, like make sure your teammates can rely on you for it. Uh, no yeah. matter what day of the week it is. I feel, I feel like that's something you're touching on right now that I feel like a lot of times what people say gets brushed under the rug. Like people brush it off as just like chalk talk or whatever. But what you're saying is is very important, and it kind of touches on what Taylor Kersey said last weekend, which was she was talking about the difference between cockiness and confidence, and she was talking about how she's confident when she plays. She is sure that when she has the puck, nothing bad will happen. She is sure that when she, when her teammates pass her the puck, she will take care of it. And I feel like that's something as a female athlete, we don't automatically assume is is positive right it's just like we tend to pass the puck off for the last second and be like oh they're gonna take care of it i don't need to take care of it or you know we tend to trust the people around us so having trust in yourself and having faith in yourself is so important it's so funny because you're you are one of the best hockey players in the world and you still are questioning yourself you're still being humble and so that's so heartening to hear because those doubts that we have in ourselves, those doubts that we have at the end of the day, at the end of the game, when we look back on our performance are normal, no matter what level of athlete you are. So thank you for being so honest about your feelings. Thank you for being so honest about your emotions. I just appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And this hurts. It hits me pretty close to home because you don't remember it, but you and I have played hockey against each other. (laughs) Ball hockey. So it's not like real hockey, but it's like ball hockey uh, I will find some sort of footage of us playing against each other, but you know, whatever. So here's a question that I've always wanted to know. You shoot lefty, right? Yep. But you're also left-handed. But so the thing is, is that in the U S we tend to have our dominant hand be our bottom hand for those, for that power. But in Canada, they tend to have their dominant hand as the top hand for more handling. Did you ever think about that difference? Did you ever, when you were, when you were deciding to shoot lefty, did, was that a conscious decision for you? It was not. I mean, I was just a little kid and I knew I wrote left-handed and someone was like, well, if you're left-handed and they gave me the stick, I don't even remember how it happened. Um, but I also didn't know it was a difference between uh, Canada and U.S. So thank you. You just taught me something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as I got older, um, I learned that having my dominant hand my left hand on on the top would probably be uh better so i blame all of my lack of stick handling skills on that so <laughs> we're gonna blame we're gonna blame your silver medal on that totally 100 <laughs> percent. but the thing is is that like when you when you are it's something about the brain the way our brains are wired when we see someone coming at us we are wired to respond to how the dominant player 
responds. So we see right-handed interactions. So when you're a lefty and you come up and you stick handle, you are at an inherent advantage. And when I started playing hockey, ball hockey, which is real hockey, thanks for calling me out, real <laughs> false prophet. Um, it is real hockey. You're right. That's how I started playing. I wanted to learn left-handed, but then I just bought a right, you know, I, I used Amber sticks. So like I wasn't going to spend 60 bucks on my own stick when I'm cheap. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, so, Shelly, I have asked you so many questions. You have been such a good sport. Um, we're going to open up to questions from, from uh, chat right now. So, have you, have you prepared yourself? I don't know. I'm a little bit nervous. But... I, I mean, you should be. No, <laughs> no offense. Um, so, the first question comes from... Also, sorry. Let's just let's just prefer this by saying, if you have questions for Shelly, this is the last time in the history of NWHL Open Ice Season One that we will be taking questions from chat. So please spam them right now. Let us know what you want to ask Shelly, the Great Olympian from the swamps, <laughs> uh, and and we will do our best to get to them. So spam them right now. You have thirty seconds while I get through these next couple questions. All right. So first question comes from Real False Prophet. When did you put on your first set of skates? Um, I don't really know. So because of having the swamp <laughs> in our backyard, <laughs> um, I first was like on sneaker. Like, so I have a brother who's seven years older than me. Uh -huh. um, he used to just like put me out there as like a dummy defenseman, and, like stick handle all around. So he just like oh my God. a bunch of equipment. Um, I think I ended up crying most of the time, but... <laughs> Um, so I was out there in sneakers from a really early age. Uh, my first probably like official time, like skating and learning how to play was probably when I was like five years old. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So um, this question comes from my brain. Uh, at what age were you better than your brother who was seven years older? I hope he's watching. <laughs> um he if he were answering, he'd say never. Uh, uh -huh, but we're not. You're you're an Olympian, so. <laughs> um i don't know uh well he stopped playing to maybe like high school and i i don't know because he stopped playing and became an old kind of just yeah yeah, yeah. so for your belly high school <laughs> so the answer is you've been better than your brother for 10 years yeah he would strongly disagree with that <laughs> i don't care you're not on the <laughs> show you're on the show and we've all seen you play hockey so <laughs> I'm pretty sure that like Connor McDavid could come at you and he's you would still shut him down from what I've seen from your <laughs> hockey play. Uh, yeah. Super anyway, <laughs> so this comes from Doctor Diablo on O N W H L. Question for Shellfish: uh, What impact did Coach Chad Wiseman have on you and your training style? Oh my gosh, um, Chad was a phenomenal coach. Um, he was uh just so passionate and cared so much and just knew so much about the game um I think his biggest impact on me was um at, like I like we'd spoken about before you'd spoken about before like this riveters sort of style of just like gutting it out and gritting it out and um I think I started playing a little bit more physical of a game um nothing like he didn't promote to be like dirty or anything like that um, right but like he just had this use your body way of of coaching that sort of just like brought it out in, in players and uh, to be physical. So I would say that would probably be like the biggest um, thing that he sort of brought out in me as a player. And I think that's one of the, one of the other things, like we tend not to be, you know, super like advocates every time we have this show, but hockey is a physical game, regardless of what your chromosomes say. Hockey is a physical game. It's not cheerleading. And I did cheerleading for six years. So I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> But using your body and being physical is just a way of the game. It's 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 hockey. It's it's not dirty. It's hockey, and that's why we love this game so much. Because you don't have to be big. You don't have to be skilled. You just have to know to use your body. Being skilled helps. But you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to give myself some support for this. Uh, Jeremy File says, "Who's your favorite mites coach?" <laughs> Um, is it is it Jeremy File? Is that who it is? Um, so, 
just for some background, uh, he's a coach of, so I'm a director of girls hockey with the Colonials, and mm -hmm. he is one of our Mike coaches, his daughters on our, our Mike team. Um, I'm not going to answer that question. I have so many great Mike coaches. Um, I'm going <laughs> to choose one. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Was he setting you up? Was that what that was? Yeah, I think he was. I think Jeremy, I respect that. I have, nothing, <laughs> I have nothing but respect for that question. Um, all right, Savage Samurai Xbox wants to know, when will we be seeing the league expand to the West Coast? Oh, um, I don't know the answer to that. I know that we are always wanting to expand. Um, and the West Coast has a great hockey community, and obviously the NHL going to um, Seattle. Um, something that we want to do, but not going to happen right now. Um, yeah, but definitely totally. that we want to make happen. I think I think what people fail to realize is that if you look at the history of the NHL, five years in, it was nowhere near the viewership. It was nowhere near where we are as a league right now. It it takes it takes. Of course, we want to have teams in San Jose, in Los Angeles, in in San Francisco. Of course, we do, but. I think what something that the NWHL, Danny and Chris have always done is focus on quality, mm -hmm. right? They want to keep the league as small as they can while maintaining quality. And then when they can focus on that quantity, it is only when they can give you the same quality that they've always given you. And I respect that so much. I respect that so much because I don't want to give you guys a bad show. I never want to give you guys a bad show. I want to give you the best show I possibly can. And so I respect that. So... I respect that that choice. All right. This is I'm really excited for this question. Um, Renee Ministrone wants to know, how did you get the nickname Captain Wildflower? <laughs> I was wondering when this was gonna come up. Yep. Um so I received this nickname uh, when I was playing on a men's league uh, one spring or summer, sort of like after the Riveter season had ended up and I was just sort of staying on the ice and um it came out that I was captain of the Riveters. And, and so my teammates, um, they just sort of came up with it. Um, I, and it stuck. Wait, <laughs> wish... wait, wait, wait. You didn't have like any wildflowers on your body, any wildflowers no. on your person. That was just the name they came up with. Yeah, I like, I'm sure one of the, my teammates has a better memory of that story. Um, <laughs> But I, that's all I remember of it. <laughs> oh my God. That's, that somehow makes it better than like having an excuse or having a reason. Yeah. I wish, I wish I had a better reason <laughs> and story, but that's all I got. <laughs> How many, uh, Twitch views or Twitter views until you get a tattoo of wildflower, wildflower on your forehead? Oh, on my forehead? I don't think there's a number. <laughs> that would be my first tattoo though. So. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. All right. <laughs> All right. This is the last question that I'm going to give you from chat. It's from Daisy on Ice. What's your favorite stretch story? And for stretch, for those of us who don't know, it's Ashley Johnston, right? Yes. Yes. Ashley Johnston. So played with her. Well, she came back this year, um, but I played with her for two seasons. Oh, my favorite stretch story story um well her dogs are amazing <laughs> <laughs> you're like um, my favorite part about stretch is her dogs dogs um which she's she's there's so many amazing things about stretch i want to make sure that i, I completely agree so while you think i'm just going to give a little backstory okay. so stretch um was supposed to play on my colorado pond hockey team and she pulled out at the last minute because she had to join a small team called the Riveters. She came out of retirement for them. Uh, we still won the championship, though. So I, I won't hold the grudge for, like, too much longer. It's a little bit longer. Um, so that's my favorite stretch story. But actually, she's... Never mind. I don't want to tell any more parts of her personal life. Um, <laughs> so back to, back to you, Shelly. Um, I think my... like So Stretch and I would always... Uh, the, I think what maybe both seasons the first thing I can't remember but would always um, work out together and and so like just getting to like bike together and go through like we all we both had like a long day at work and, and then she's commuting from Albany so she's driving forever and she'd woken up at like 
I don't know, some ridiculous time in the morning, go to work, <laughs> practice on time. And then we go through practice and then um, work out together. And like, we both sort of just like held each other accountable and we're exhausted and, and all that. So um, I think she's just, that's just like one example of how amazing of a teammate uh, she is. I know that yeah. there's definitely like more fun stories about her as like a few, <laughs> um, but I think that's probably like my, I'm like very grateful that I had her that year. Cause I don't know if I would have been as, um, like productive as, yes yes thank you <laughs> yeah I, I that's that's very important like someone who's gonna hold you accountable someone who's gonna make you productive is very important so you know stretch being there may not be a very good entertaining story but i thought it was entertaining and also <laughs> it made you the the player that you are today aside from growing up in a swamp um <laughs> absolutely so shelly you have been absolutely fantastic. If if not inspiring us, you have taught us the importance of trap day um, for <laughs> each and every one of us. Do you, do you, I was trying to say that with a straight face. It didn't work out too well. Um, do you have any parting words for us at home? Uh, any inspirational words as you Olympian boss of everyone could give us? as boss of everyone everyone <laughs> no um i think i mean especially given the times and what's going on um i just hang in there um and help out other people as, as much as you can um and and just try to stay positive we'll get through this and um and everything will will, will be okay <laughs> everything's going to be okay i i respect that so much like that's more important than any other message you can give is that just telling people that we're going to be okay. So thank you. No, uh, great. <laughs> uh, thank you absolutely so much, Shelly, for stopping by tonight. I can't wait to see what you do in both of your roles this year in the league. I can't wait to have you on next year on to open ice, maybe like a year from now um, and, and hear more about your development and hear more about what you've done for the league. I, I can only imagine what someone like you who cares so deeply about women's hockey, who cares so deeply about the league and is now in a position to help things and change things is going to do. So thank you so much. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun and absolutely. I look forward to next, next year with you. Fantastic. We'll see you then. It's a date. Now you can't back out. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll put it on the calendar. All right. See you later. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Shelly Picard, everyone. <laughs> it's time. Time is now. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our final sign off to the final episode of Open Ice. I I love you guys. I so a lot of people still don't really know who I am and I'm fine with that because I'm about the league and what I do is only to support the league. I love what everyone's doing. I firmly believe in the mission that Danny Ryland has done. I firmly believe in the mission of the NWHL. Um, but I am actually a medical doctor. The gamer doc thing isn't just a, a ploy. Um, so I am on the front lines of what's what's been going on now. And you all have made this bearable. You all have made this enjoyable. You have all given me a reason and an opportunity to perform on Monday nights and to be here for you. And these women are, are absolutely inspirational. I walk out of this thing and I, I am nothing but energized. I am nothing but exalted. I, am, I feel so wonderful. Um, I just, I just want to thank all of you at home for being here, for making this experience. For making this experience so wonderful, um, to the mods, Amber, Caroline, Laurel, Dashmaker, um, to the constant people who show up every day, like Murphy, Gladys, um, Unicorn Duke, just, I, I, you, you all are so wonderful. We are in the infancy stages of this NH NWHL, and what we're doing is changing things. It's, it's. It's making things happen, and you showing up has has changed everything and has made this a better. Anyways, I had to stop talking. Uh, <laughs> I love you guys so much. I did something. I prepared something for you. Um, 
that I'm going to play at the end of this episode that I've worked on for entirely too long for me to think about. <laughs> I told myself I wasn't going to cry, but... <laughs> um. I love you guys. This is a four minute long video. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Welcome everyone to the first ever episode of NWHL Open Ice, a very special edition. Tonight on the show we have Jillian Dempsey, Anya Becker, Freddie, Taylor, Akrim, Sira, Jasto, Arena. We're going to do a little game of Would You Rather. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Please answer them as truthfully and as quickly as possible. Would you rather be a reverse centaur or a reverse mermaid? Mermaid. Head of a fish. Cool. <laughs> you rather always have to look for your keys for 10 minutes before finding them or always smell like roast beef? Would you rather never be able to play on the Connecticut Whale again or have five more years of guaranteed seasons and an Isabel Cup but have to spend one year of your life as an actual whale? W what kind of whale do I get to be? Connecticut whale. Oh, I don't understand the question. Is that a species of whale? It's not even the weirdest thing we've done on this show. Don't act like it is. There's never enough poutine. We all know that putting your sock in a toilet bowl is going to make someone upset. I'm talking about it. We're Canucks. We're, we're born in, uh, in the igloos. And <laughs> we take polar bears to school. So I don't know about you guys, but one of my favorite parts of this show is getting to know these athletes. And as we get to know the athletes, we learn how they talk about one another. Jill. Allie Funstrom. Louie. Occurs. It's Madison Pack. Haley Bratkin. Allie Funstrom. Everyone knows Dumps. Packer and Leary. It's with love. It's with admiration. It's with the utmost respect. She's just such a good kid. We're very thankful for the group that, that I have this year. So, come on. You could physically be on her 100% and she'll still find a way to put it in the net. She's very offensive and always makes things happen. They're just role models. Obviously, like, my line mates are very talented. She's an amazing leader for our team. We, we're all here. We're all competing. We all want the best for each other. She's way faster than me. She's a great skater. And, and it's so cool to look back on the progress of this hockey, too, because mm -hmm. when I aspired to be like her, there was no NWHL. And yep. now here I am. I believe in the mission of the NWHL. You know, they want to do whatever it takes to, to grow the game. If you love the sport, you should be able to play the sport. Mm -hmm. I, I really do just love playing hockey. Women play sports too. There is a professional setting for women. That was one of my favorite moments of my whole entire life, knowing that women could be paid to play hockey. As women and athletes, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'm so, so thankful. Just being here in general. I just oh love being God. here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. I just want to thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me. I would love to just say thank you. Thank you to all the fans. Thank you so much. Seriously, thank you to everyone on Twitch, everyone that comes to our games and supports us. Thanks to all the Twitch fans and all the Boston Pride fans out there. We love our fans. You know, we couldn't do it without you guys. So. Falling back in love with the game of hockey, thanks to this league and it was a really cool feeling and experience to play for the White Caps. Can like honestly I can't even put into words like how amazing and how appreciative each and every single one of them is. But none of it matters without you guys. It wouldn't be as special without every single one of you by our side. So thank you all so much for being here. Take care of yourselves this weekend. Be kind to each other. Have a happy have a healthy week. Have a happy and healthy week everyone. It's gonna be so good. Go hockey. So, so awesome. Go I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited.